being the last speaker, I surely do not want to run over, so I have my timer here. <laughs> so I am uh, very happy to have a chance to be here to talk about this paper. This is very much work in progress, and so I'm particularly looking for uh, comments and feedback uh, from people. Uh, this is work that's being done uh, jointly with John Haltewanger, my colleague at Maryland, Claire Hu, who is a graduate student at Maryland, and Kristen Sandusky and Jim Spletzer at the Census Bureau. And so I need to uh, say that all of the opinions and conclusions here are those of the authors and do not necessarily represent the views of the U.S. Census Bureau. And further, that all results have been reviewed to ensure that no confidential information has been disclosed, which is, you'll see when I start going through what we have is, turns out to be quite a constraint. Um, we are also grateful to the Sloan Foundation for financial support for this project. So what is it that we're trying to look at in this, in this paper? It's well known that the self-employment rate, the share of people, working people who are self-employed, rises with age. And our motivation in this, in this paper is to try to understand why it is that that's occurring. There's a number of ways that you could see self-employment rising with age. It could be because as people get older, on net, more of them are moving from wage and salary work into self-employment work. It could be because people who are self-employed are just more likely to keep working at older ages. Or it could be that you know, even after people have left the labor force, that they're more likely to come back into self-employment than they are to come back into wage and salary work. So one of the things that we're trying to do in this paper is to document how these different possible transitions among labor market states contribute to the growth in the self-employment rate with age. A second thing that we're trying to do, and you'll see we're not quite as far along with this, is to uh, begin to understand what it is that drives these transition rates across these labor market states. Who is it that's more or less likely to make various transitions, and how does that contribute to rising self-employment with age? And then finally, something that we don't, because of uh, issues with getting access to data, don't address at all in this version of the paper, is to begin thinking about how the growth of the gig economy may have affected all of this and the behavior of, of self-employment by age. There are a set of related of papers that have looked at related uh, issues. If you go back to uh, Dick Fuchs's 1982 paper, and then there's some work by Zisimopoulos and Carolee. They've used HRS data to study the growth in self-employment with age. And they take a cohort of people who were employed and then follow them. And they find that uh, some of the increase in self-employment with, with age is due to people switching from wage and salary to self-employment work, but a lot of it's due to differential persistence. That's not answering the same question, though, as you know, trying to figure out if you look at a cross-sectional data set like the CPS, why the share of working people who are self-employed is rising because it leaves out the people who weren't working the, the point they started. Um, there's a, another set of studies that have looked at these transition rates. Uh, there's a number of them, including uh, your, your paper, um, that has uh, where it documented the rate at which older adults move from one state to another. But I haven't been able to identify a paper that goes beyond presenting that as interesting descriptive information to try to trace out what the implications are for the, the change in self-employment over time. And then finally, there's a set of studies that have tried to look at the factors that determine some of these transition rates. There's papers that look at why it is that people, who it is that moves from wage and salary employment to self-employment. There's a set of papers that uh, uh, there's a, one paper that I found that looked at what it is that determines why people come back from out of the labor force into, into self-employment as opposed to wage and salary employment. One issue is that a lot of this work has used data from the Health and Retirement Study, and it's a really great study, but for looking at this kind of question, the sample sizes are pretty small. There's just not that many people who are in self-employment, and so then trying to model those transition rates, you run out of data pretty quickly. So what are we trying to do in this paper? In this paper, uh, we've done three things. We've developed a data infrastructure for looking at these questions that I will describe to you. Um, 
We've done some analysis of transitions among these various states, wage and salary employment, self-employment, out of the labor force. And then we've begun to look at what we can say about the effect of individual characteristics on these transition rates and their implications. So let me start by describing the data that we're using. And a lot of our effort in this project to date has gone into putting together this data infrastructure. So we've started with a sample of people who were, for whom we have information from the annual social and economic supplement to the CPS. Uh, we have data for the, the years 1996 to 2013, which means we know about what these people were doing in 1995 through 2012. And then we have linked to those data information from the Social Security Administration on their earnings histories. And for all of these people, we have data on their earnings histories beginning in 1978 and then up through 2012, which is the last year that at this point we're looking at. We convert all those earnings data to 2012 dollars. And then when we merge the data to the, the CPS records, we sort of relabel the timing so that for everybody for whom we know, we observe in the CPS, we know what their earnings over the previous 20 years were, what their earnings this year were, and then what their earnings the next year were. And we're using those earnings to categorize them as either being wage and salary or self-employed uh, or out of the labor force. We do have to, we do lose some sample when we're doing this. In order to link the data, we need to have a personal identification key, basically. It's an encrypted social security number to match to the earnings records. We lose some people, reweight re the observations to take that into account. We drop a few people whose with the stated age wasn't consistent with their age from the Numadent records. Um, we restrict our sample to people who were age 23 to age 77 um, for reasons I, I, I won't go into. And then we lose a couple of years of data because we don't have a full 20 years of history or because we don't actually yet have data for what they're doing the following year. So what are we doing with, so what do we end up with? We end up with what sounds like a huge sample of 1.2 million people that we observe. Um, we take those people and we want to start looking at their self, their employment patterns by age. And this, this is the thing that's going to seem odd. Why, if we're trying to look at things by age, did we group our data into six-year age groups? And basically, the reason that we are looking at six-year age groups in this version of the paper is because we're going to get four more years of data soon. And when the Census Bureau does their disclosure reviews on our new paper, they're going to look at how many people we have in each of the cells we've defined. And so if we had used one-year age groups or two-year age groups here, then what they would look at is how many people there were who were in the starting period, self-employed, who transited to wage and salary employment over the four years that we're adding. So we have done this in this version of the paper to try to preserve flexibility to be able to look at what we want to uh, more precisely in the next version of the paper. Um, so as I said, we've used the, this earnings data that we've linked into the CPS files to categorize people as either being dominant wage and salary, meaning that they get a majority of their earnings in the year from wage and salary, uh, as dominant self-employed, meaning that they get 50% or more of their earnings from self-employment, or as not employed, they didn't have any earnings during the year. So just to give you a sense of what the data are telling us about self-employment rates, I've plotted uh, two sets of things up here. The black lines here are our estimates of the self-employment rate by age group uh, from these, these Social Security earnings data. And you can see that it goes up uh, quite steeply. The solid line is the share of working people who have any self-employment income. The dotted line is the share of people whose dominant source of income is self-employment. And then just for comparison, I've put the red lines, which are a similar thing, but based on what people said in the current population survey about their earnings. The pattern is the same. You have rising self-employment with age. 
the levels are lower. And at the oldest ages, if you're looking at the people who are primarily self-employed, compare the dotted black line to the dotted red line, in the administrative data, we're seeing a much steeper rise in self-employment than we're seeing in the current population survey data, which is sort of consistent with other things that we've found um, in other work, finding that people um, don't report all of their self-employment in the CPS. OK, so what we're looking at in this paper is uh, we're interested in these transition rates across states and what their implications are. Let me just show you what the transition rates look like. Uh, the dotted red line here is sh showing you the share of people who are wage and salary who stay in wage and salary the following year. It's pretty flat, and then it starts to fall off as they get to retirement age. The dotted blue line is self-employment persistence. At every age, people who are self-employed are less likely to remain in that state than people who are in wage and salary employment, but it falls off less with age. And then the dark black line is non-employment. If you're non-employed at a young age, there's a pretty good chance you'll be working the following year. But as you get older, that's less true. This graph is showing the sort of the flip side of that. It's showing you. For people who begin in a given state, what state they're in a year later. And there's a lot going on in this graph, and let me just try to walk through it. Look first at the dotted blue line and the dotted red line. What those are are the transitions from self-employment to wage and salary employment. It's the blue, and then the reverse. One thing that you see is that with age, people become a lot less likely transition from self-employment to wage and salary employment, but that the reverse isn't true. It's pretty, it's pretty flat. The second thing I'd like you to look at is the solid blue line and the solid red line. Those are the probabilities that people transition from the blue self-employment to out of the labor force, the red uh, wage and salary work to out of the labor force. It's always higher for the self-employed self people. But the relative increase in the probability of leaving the labor force rises a lot more for the wage and salary workers at older ages. And then the third thing I want to draw your attention to are the black lines. The solid black line is moving from non-employment into wage and salary employment. The dotted black line is moving from not out of the labor force to self-employment. There's a huge decline in the probability that if you're out of the labor force, you come back into wage and salary employment, but you don't see that same sharp drop off for self-employment. So that's sort of what the pattern of these transitions looks like. There's a relationship, of course, between these transition rates and the stocks that we're interested in. So if you think about somebody starting in any state, they have a probability of your wage and salary, there's some probability that you're not employed in the next period, some probability that your wage and salary the next period, some probability that you're self-employed the next period, and so on. So you can trace out the evolution of these stocks. It's also possible, given these transition rates, to figure out what the steady state looks like. And that's what these equations at the bottom are telling us. So we have taken these. Uh, there's, a, there's, a set of, there's a set of papers that have sort of used this idea to try to look at the evolution of labor market stocks over time. Um, a paper that Rob Scheimer and I wrote some years ago now uh, used this approach to try to look at why female employment was falling and where it was in terms of the transitions that that was coming from. Rob has done a lot of work on looking at business cycle fluctuations in unemployment and whether what's driving that is you know, people being more likely to be laid off or less likely to find jobs. Here we're asking a slightly different question. Here what we're asking is how changes in these transition rates with age affect the steady state shares of people who at different ages are self-employed, wage and salary workers out of the labor force. And then if we know that, we also know what's happening to the self-employment rate. So what we have done here is to try to trace that out. We've, the, um, the dark lines here are just the data. 
This is by age group. What share of people are wage and salary, self-employed, not employed, and then what the self-employment rate is. And then the red dotted lines are what those transition rates imply about the steady state values for each of those things. And you can see that the steady state you know, sort, of, sort of tracks with the, what the actual data. The steady state numbers are overshooting all of the actual numbers because if you start in a given state and then you change the transition rates, it's going to take time for the actual data to catch up with what the new steady state looks like. They're exactly right for thinking about what the, the long-term implications of the transition rates are. So the nature of the exercise that we've carried out is to, given this, these steady, the, the steady state implications of the transition rates and the changes in those transition rates with age, to try to figure out what it is that's changing as people get older to account for the rise in the self-employment rate that's over in the bottom right-hand panel there. And I'll focus mainly on, on that. So if you think about what could be happening, one thing that could be happening is that as people get older, they're, less like, they're more likely to move from wage and salary employment to self-employment and less likely to move in the other direction. What if that was the only thing that we allowed to change? Uh, we're not going to do a very good job of, of capturing the, the decline in the share of, uh, and I should say here we're starting just with people age 41. So it's a different age range than in, the, in some of what I looked at before. Um, we're not obviously going to do a very good job of capturing the decline in employment because we're shutting all of that down. Um, but we are picking up an influence of the change in those flows on self-employment, and that can explain part of what we're seeing in terms of the increase in the steady state self-employment share. Uh, a second set of things that could be going on is, if we, now we're going to shut that down, and we're just going to look at the changes with age in flows into and out of non-employment. As people get older, the relative probability that if you're a wage and salary worker, you leave the labor force goes up. And at older ages, the relative probability that if you come back to work, you come back as a self-employed person goes up. And so if you look at the effect of those flows on the steady state self-employment rate, again, down in the bottom right-hand corner, uh, that can explain some of what we're seeing. We've done some calculations that I won't show you in detail that look just at allowing changes in the flows out of employment with age, just looking at the change in flows from out of employment back into the workforce with age. Um, we'd like to try to find a way, we wanted to try to find a way to summarize what was going on with this. So the, the, little, the back of the envelope exercise that we've done here is to say, if we look at people between ages 41 to 46 and ages 71 to 77, the self-employment rate goes up by nearly 20 percentage points, so a, a huge increase. What, it is, what is it that's driving that? So if we just allow the rates of switching between wage and salary employment and self-employment to change as they actually do between age 41 to 46 and 71 to 77. That accounts for about 40% of this. If we shut that down and just allow the flows into and out of the labor force to change as they actually do, that accounts for about 60% of this. Um, makes it look like it all adds up neatly to 100%. That's not necessarily by any means a foregone conclusion. These are, this, this whole thing is very nonlinear. Um, so, for example, if I looked separately at allowing flows into non-employment to change and then at flows out of non-employment to change, the effect of those things separately doesn't add up to the effect of letting both of them change. But I think it gives us a sense, at least, of what you, the relative importance of these, of these, different, um, these different things. So that's the first thing that we, we've 
tried to do. The second thing that we tried to do um, is to look at the effects of different characteristics on these transition probabilities. Who is it that is, as people get older, are becoming more or less likely to make these transitions? And the way that we've tried to do this is to take our data and then to estimate an equation for each of the six possible transition rates. So from self-employment, wage and salary employment, non-employment, into the other three states. Um, if we have those estimates, then we can figure out you know, what the effect of a change in any factor is on the probability of persisting in your current state or making any of those transitions. This is very exploratory at this point. Uh, the variables that we've, we've tried uh, looking at in the models that we have are education. Uh, we don't have wealth in these data, but we do know what people's cumulative earnings were over the prior 20 years, which we treat as sort of a proxy for, for wealth. And then we've looked at the variability of earnings over the, the previous 20 years. And so we, we look at the effects of these factors, and then we look at how the effects of those factors vary with age. Um, it's, this is hard to digest, and, and something that we will do in the next iteration is to sort of take these results and translate through to how they're affecting the stocks that we're really interested in. But we do see some things. Just to take, for example, having a college degree. People who have a college degree are, as they get older, become relatively more likely than people who are less educated to move into self-employment. People with a college degree, as they come, get, become older, become relatively more likely, uh, relatively less likely to, um, if, if they're out of the labor force, to transition back into self-employment. And then, at least up to a certain point, they're less likely to, to leave the labor force. And so, it's sort of saying that as people get older, it's the more educated people whose self-employment rates are, are rising. Uh, but I think there's more that we can do with this. Um, in fact, <laughs> there's quite a lot more that I think we can do with this. As I said, this is sort of a progress report. A big thing that we want to do is to incorporate additional data. I'm a little torn about this. If we, as soon as we get these data for 2012 to 2015, add them to our analysis and do what we're going to do, then when we get the next year's data, excuse my French, we're screwed. <laughs> we're going we're to really start running into uh, sample size constraints and disclosure issues. So we want to look at more recent data, but I think we want to put off releasing anything with the more recent data as, as long as we can in some sense. Um, uh, one of the things that we've done in this iteration of the paper is we've only defined three states. You're self-employed, you're a wage and salary worker, you're not working. But there's a lot of people who have both self-employment income and wage and salary income, and I think likely we'll want to try to move from having three states to having four states, which I think will help us as well with understanding the transitions that people are making um, as they get, get older. In, with all of this, our plan is to go to looking at single years of age rather than these six-year age groups. I think there's a lot more we can do with looking at additional factors that might explain who's making these transitions, given that we have this very rich earnings history that we haven't really much exploited. Um, the, the, the idea is once we have looked at those factors, that we also will you know, sort of trace through what the implications are for uh, the states that people end up in. Um, and then finally, the thing that got us started with this project in the first place was that we were interested in thinking about the growth of the gig economy and how that may have affected the opportunities available to people at older ages, and in this context, how that may have affected their transitions across states and the share of them who end up being self-employed. In some other work that we're doing, we have found evidence, uh, looking at data for non-employers in the, in the census data, that there, have, there are sectors where there's been a big increase in um, non-employee work, uh, the, the taxi and limousine uh, driver industry in particular. So there, there's obviously some important changes that have been underway, and uh, we're, we're interested to see how that's played out more broadly. Let me stop. Thank you. All right. So. Uh 
So I recognize I'm the only thing standing between you and lunch, so I will try to be mindful of, of the time and, and keep my uh, remarks uh, brief. So, so I'm going to start by saying um, I really liked this paper. I mean, I think it was a really well done analysis with a rich data set, and, and I enjoyed reading it. I learned a lot. Um, and maybe I'm biased, but you know, John Shanti Ramnath and I have done a study of self-employment at older ages, and you know, our starting observation was was similar that there seemed to be a lot of self-employed people at older ages, um, and and so so our paper was sort of motivated by that same observation. You know, what's going on? What they do in this paper, I think, is is do a really good job of teasing out the factors that that contribute to that increase in self-employment at at older ages. Um, and just to summarize my takeaways from this paper, um, one of the, the drivers of this increase at, in self-employment at older ages is that the probability of transitioning from self-employment to, to wage and salary work versus the reverse transition from, from wage and salary work to self-employment, that sharply decreases by age. Um, the probability of transitioning to not working rises more sharply for wage and salary workers compared to self-employed workers. Um, and finally, the probability of transitioning from not working to wage and salary employment um, versus transitioning from not working to self-employment um, declines with age. And I picked out this graph because I think this graph does a really nice job of, of summarizing their results, even though you know, there's a lot of stuff going on, but, but all the different channels uh, that contribute to, to this um, this rise in self-employment rates are present here. So the probability of transitioning from self-employment to wage and salary work um, decreases sharply with age. Um, and you can kind of see that um, reflected here in this graph. Um, however, the, prob the, the reverse transition, um, the probability of trans of, of uh, of, uh, of transitioning from, from uh, wage and salary work to self-employment kind of remains small and, and roughly consistent at, at, at older ages. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that's pretty consistent with what John and Shanti and I found is, you know, we, we saw that, you know, even despite the fact that there's this large increase in the self-employment share at older ages, there's kind of only a slight trickle into self-employment in any given year. Um, one thing we did note is there is a, an uptick in that trickle at key retirement ages, like 62 and um, full retirement age. Now, that's not something that I think they're able to, to, to do because of the, the age buckets. Um, but that is something we, we had observed. And, and um, we, we tended to interpret this as using self-employment along the path to retirement. But that uptick, even with that uptick, it's a pretty small trickle. Um, the bigger effect here is that the probabilities of transitioning to not working um, for self-employed individuals versus wage and salary workers get smaller um, at, at older ages. So you can kind of see that in the, in the I think, in the solid uh, blue and red lines. Um, and finally, the probability of transitioning from not working to wage and salary employment declines sharply. That's the, the black line that kind of drops. Um, as you get older, um, however, it drops less sharply for, for, uh, for uh, self-employed workers. Um, so, so I think this graph does a really good job of, of kind of summarizing the results. And um, you know, I know the author said that, that um, this, this is kind of a progress report. There's lots of things that they're considering exploring. So what I thought I'd focus my, my discussion on is um, I'm just going to throw out some suggestions for, for things to explore. Um, and this is sort of stuff that came up in the work that, that I did with, uh, with John and Shanti. Um, so essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to encourage them to uh, explore the story a little bit more. Um, so, so one question that, that you know, John and Shanti and I explored in, in kind of some detail is what role does self-employment play as a bridge job? And so what we kind of looked at there was we looked at switches from wage and salary work to self-employment along the path to retirement. And a couple of things they could do uh, to kind of explore this story a little bit more uh, might be to look at how, um, how uh, uh, income and hours change with, with these switches. Um, and, you know, we had explored this using tax administrative data. The CPS data would allow them to, and, and we looked at hours using the HRS, but that's a relatively small sample. Um, they would be able to look at hours with, with um, kind of a much, much uh, bigger sample here, I think. Um, they could also look at how industry and occupation changes with these switches. That's something we did a little bit with the HRS, but, but um, 
you know, it would be nice to have a better picture of what the common stories are here. Um, a couple of times I've had an Uber or a Lyft driver tell me that, that basically they've retired after a career um, doing something else entirely, and then once they retired from that career, got bored and decided to go become an Uber or a Lyft driver. So that's kind of an interesting story. How common is that? Um, I'm not sure. Um, another possible story is how many of these people are going back to work for their old employers as contractors. Um, that might be another, another story. So I'd just be interested in knowing what, what are kind of some of the, the common stories here that, that we see when somebody's using self-employment, they're, they're switching to self-employment along the transition to retirement. Okay, and so then looking at another one of these mechanisms, the, the probability of stopping work rises more for wage and salary workers than it does for self-employed with age. Um, one thing I'd be curious about is what about work intensity, um, such as earnings or hours? Um, it is possible and, and that, that uh, self-employment makes it easier to prolong your working career um, by giving you a way to, to uh, reduce hours, reduce effort without quitting completely. So I wonder, you know, to what extent is that going on? Um, and then the other, other thing I'd be interested to know more about is how have these relationships changed over time and over the business cycle? They've got this long series of data that, that allows um, exploration of this. Um, I think one aspect that they're, they've proposed looking at is, is looking at gig work because of the increase in, in gig work uh, more recently. But in addition to that, You've got a couple of recessions. You've got some important policy changes, like the elimination of the, the earnings, uh, earnings test beyond full retirement age. So it might be interesting to, to explore um, some, of, some of these. Um, the final thing I want to talk about is, uh, is the role of health insurance. So, so this is something other authors have uh, considered. And the results are not super consistent. So, so that could be something to, to look at in a little bit more detail. Um, you know, I think the, the CPS data, I believe, has data on employer-sponsored health insurance. A another way you could look at this is by looking at transitions that occur at medical, uh, Medicare eligibility. There's also data on spousal health insurance. Um, and I wonder to what extent there's an interaction where people with employer-sponsored health insurance are more sensitive to, to health insurance availability in both transitioning to, to not working and to self-employment. Um, you might even be able to look at whether, whether there's a difference pre and post Affordable Care Act if, if you get data um, kind of more uh, as, as recent as, as possible. Um, one issue that, that we ran into when we were looking, we were trying to look at the impact of, of health insurance was uh, it's hard to separate social security or pension eligibility from uh, uh, health insurance concerns. Um, so, so, you know, it was hard to do in the HRS because the samples were fairly small. In our tax administrative data, we looked at one older cohort and one younger cohort. Um, so there wasn't really any variation in full retirement age. I, I wonder if they're able to do this a little bit more once they're able to look by, by single year of age. Um, and the other thing that, that we kind of thought about a little bit, never really went anywhere, but, but it's worth um, considering for future research, is what about policy variation? Um, so, so there is state-level policy variation that, that might affect access to, to health insurance for self-employed individuals. Um, there are state regulations that, that do affect this. So, so I wonder if it might be possible to, to use that to say something um, more about the impact of, of health insurance, since that does seem to be a big, big factor for a lot of people in labor market transitions, and since the previous literature hasn't really been conclusive on, on the role that it plays in, in self-employment. Um, so I will stop there.